<laughs> okay. Um, Audacious started as a conference in 2004, uh, but the journey of Audacious started a long time before then really. It was probably in around 1997. My wife and I were youth pastors in Sheffield and uh, we'd started the youth ministry with 11 teenagers and it had begun to grow. And uh, believe it or not, I used to be the guitar player and my wife was the worship leader. And I'll never forget one night, um, I just said to Sophie, Sophie, this is crazy. We're gonna have to raise up some more musos. And uh, she said, but none of them play music. Uh, I think there was one person who played, played another instrument. So basically one night after youth, I went to about six to eight different young people. I said, okay, you're going to learn guitar, you're going to learn drums, you're going to learn bass, you're going to be vocals, you're going to lead worship. Lynn asked me once to um, kind of head up the Sunday night worship and uh, like I hadn't really thought about leading worship or anything. I was in youth when Glyn was a youth pastor in Sheffield and he started a band um, like telling telling children, youth, that uh, you're going to play the bass, you're going to play the drums, you're going to do this, you're going to do that. And uh, I kind of just watched on because I was, I was actually too young to be in youth at the time. But um, we just started to do that and uh, led the Sunday night meetings for a while for worship. So I kind of started singing at youth and then I sang at church, just leading worship at church when I was like 14 and uh, gave them six weeks to learn instruments and to learn vocals and then six weeks later a band started and um, yeah it was it was awful basically the worship was was terrible um, I was minding my own business in little old Scunthorpe and uh, I got a phone call from one of my friends called Simon Bolton who was the drummer at the time in the band Rachel Taylor who's the previous bass player uh, she moved to Hillsong to do their um, music academy there and uh, so, which left a gap. So Cy phoned me and asked me if I'd like to join the band, uh, to which I, I had a quick think about and was like, yeah, you're all right, I'll join. And um, came over and uh, no one else knew about it, I found out after that. <laughs> and then, uh... So uh, I first got involved with the Yeah album. Um, I don't know if it, what it was called when I got involved, but uh, basically got invited to come and uh, visit some practices that the band were having, writing songs and uh, uh, just helping them out with that. So um, I just turned up, didn't really know what to expect. I didn't actually know anybody. Um, I'd only met Glyn a couple of times before he invited me. So I just was helping basically with um, songwriting, just, um, you know, trying to be a, give an outside opinion. <laughs> <laughs> nod your head is, is um, nod your head. I, I walked into the studio one day when the band were writing a song. I said, guys, I've got a brilliant lyric for, for a song. And they're like, what is it? And I said, what about nod your head? Because we've had, you know, jump, we've had put your hands up, we've had, you know, do all these sorts of things. What about, you know, nod your head? And so the guys absolutely ribbed me. They said, nod your head, what, what an absolutely rubbish you know lyric that would be I'm like no that'd be fantastic I, and I'm, I say no come on imagine this imagine thousands of delegates all nodding their head in unison wouldn't that be an unbelievable thing and they're like no Glenn you're you're old school you know leave leave the the songwriting to us and um you know I, I even you know came up with a lyric nod your head because God is winning nod your head because God is winning and I came up with with a, with a, a tune for it thought of nod your head because God is winning nod your head like this we did slip a little bit of the song into Audacious Conference without anyone noticing, which was, uh, for me and Joel, was a highlight. So we go, okay, come on Audacious, God doesn't just want you to nod your head. And we literally had 2,000 people nodding their head. And we just looked at Glyn and winked, and it was a priceless moment. And then, but the funniest thing of the whole story for me is a year later, we're in South Africa, and, um, and we're, driving, we're driving to Andre Kreef's house and um, there's me, Andre and Glyn in the car and, um, we, and Foz and we're just driving along. And um, it sort of came out there somehow over a meal that the lyric nod your head and the tune I had completely plagiarised from a youth pastor in Cape Town. Uh, sorry Andre for stealing it. Um, and uh, yeah, but I did confess, I wasn't sprung, I did confess. Yeah, he goes, I've got to be honest, I actually stole it 
off these guys here. So we're like, I can't believe it. One, I couldn't believe it because it was actually a song and someone had made a song called Nod Your Head that was good. And, um, but I couldn't believe he claimed it as one of his own ideas and then, and then trying to palm it off on us, of which we could have potentially written a song and put it on an album that we'd have then probably got busted for in court later on as someone else's song. So 2004 was our first audacious conference. We did it in Keele University. Superb conference. We had Delirious play one night. Um, we, we had a, a huge marquee that we had all the delegates in. On um, one particular night, we got thrown out of the marquee due to environmental health. Uh, yeah, we got kicked out, out of the tent. So uh, the first year of audacious, we got kicked out of the tent for being too noisy which uh, it's got to be a winner. Apparently the noise went up behind the clouds, travelled for 11 miles behind the, the clouds, and then where the clouds opened up, the noise dropped out of the heavens into somebody's back garden, but amplified, and because of that, they shut us down. That's what we were there for, but we got kicked out of the tent, and we had to pull off, like, with an hour's notice or something, we had to pull off back-to-back -back meetings in the uh, student union bar. So Delirious uh, were brilliant because they did two back-to-back -back gigs for us that night in a small, smaller indoor setting. And uh, that was amazing. And then, but the next day we were back in the tent and everyone was going mental. We are in the tent. We said, we are in the tent. And uh, it just went on for ages and it was just kind of a real anthemic kind of feel. Portsmouth. Uh, Chris Hill was preaching and uh, he was preaching on kill, steal, destroy and uh, it was my favourite moment for a lot of different reasons. One is that you stood in a conference and you're listening to Chris Hill wielding a sword shouting kill, steal, destroy and just looking around and seeing all the stu stewards that actually worked at the venue sort of thinking what is this guy on about? We thought it would be a brilliant idea to finish the conference with a, um, a fireworks display. So I, I'd always wanted to have a pig on a spit, and so we got a pig on a spit, roasting a pig on an open spit. We had 1,500 delegates at the end of the last session come down to this big open field, pig roasting, carving off, people having pork sandwiches. Uh, just what a great idea. We, r we brought in a professional fireworks company, which was, you know, um, we're gonna be a superb night. They were gonna write audacious in the sky, and we had all this, fantastic stuff happened. When literally three or four minutes into the fireworks display, one of the fireworks exploded in the canister in the moist, in the moist ground and shot across, literally just across our heads into the crowd. And it was just pandemonium, people running everywhere. And um, we ended up with CSI in and, uh, and all these sorts of things. And apparently there was a malfunction in the manufacturing process in China and all these sorts of things. That was a really, that was, that was a, that was a scary moment. Oh yeah. There was this one year when, like, we did this whole boys versus girls thing and um, the guys decided to actually just walk off stage and leave me. I'm not going to go that way. Um, the guys just decided to walk off stage and leave me. Literally, so they all walked off stage and there was just me with the microphone trying to get the girls going. That was pretty scary, but quite fun at the same time because I was just like, I'm going to carry on whether you're with me or not. That's probably, probably the second memory, and it, it's a reoccurring memory from every year of Audacious Conference, is literally seeing the altar call packed mm. um, most days with young people, number one, giving their lives to Christ for the first time. Secondly, people rededicating their lives to Christ. And thirdly, young people, young adults, university students, just saying, God, I surrender my life to you, whatever it is. I think just seeing like the kind of people journey is massive, like over the years, people that have been coming to Audacious over the years, um, just seeing them now, like from the start of the conference, people aren't warming up. So by the end, you know, it's passionate. It's on the first night, people are coming now with expectancy. And I think just seeing the atmosphere that's created every year, like people just come in hungry. Yeah, I remember Wigan, one of the uh, events on that tour, and there were 700 uh, kids, and, and it was a big kind of warehouse, and they'd, they'd had all these curtains across um, so that you could section off different parts of the building. Um, and they basically had to keep 
ripping the curtains back to allow more people in. There's 700 kids here, um, like something is happening, like God is literally moving, God is doing something powerful. And, and that started to change my heart to think, ah, oh, what is really important at the end of the day? Um, it's, it's people getting saved and people connecting with God. And you, there's no point doing events if no one comes. I remember for me, the first time I kind of came into the idea of Audacious City Churches, uh, me and Glyn and Jen were driving back up from London after mastering what must have been the Forget Not album. And um, we're just driving up and Glyn starts just talking to me about he's got a passion in his heart for, uh, for Manchester. Audacious City Church, which has seen incredible growth in just you know, the last two and a quarter years from 90 people to, you know, in excess of 1,200 people over the course of a month. You know, um, we've seen in excess of 1,000 people get saved. We're running four services on a Sunday, which is fantastic. And also in May, so eight months ago, we launched a church campus in Krakow in Poland, which is, uh, again, uh, such a great opportunity, you know. Um, the exciting thing about being part of Audacious is, um, like, I, I, I don't... I think people probably get the wrong idea and they think, oh, it's a youth thing, it's a youth church and, um, and all the rest of it. But, um, you know, I, I don't consider myself youth anymore. I, I've started to realise that. Uh, and uh, uh, I just think, you know, church is about everybody. So, um, so although we have a sound that we've created for specific purposes um, over the past few years, and we've been really trying to develop songs which, which will speak to the church um, and, the, and church is everybody, church is just family. Um, and so, so in terms of sound and the future, um, the exciting thing about God is that he's so creative that um, you know, nothing holds him back in that, do you know what I mean? And I think that he doesn't want us to be held back by certain styles or certain ways of doing things. Um, we just want to write songs which people can connect with and people can worship to. He's filming. <laughs> He's filming. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel awkward. <laughs>